Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Writing Workshop Wednesdays in the Nature Journal Club. Let me just pull up um, my presentation and we'll get started. So everybody can hear me in, all right, and can you see the presentation? Great. All right, so today's um, meeting is about Mary Oliver. So first a question to get started, if you would like to answer in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, what's, what do you like to be called and where in the world are you? And have you read any Mary Oliver poems before? And if you do, do you have a favorite one? Good morning. This is Danny. Um, I just want to say I got her book about dog poems. And it's just lovely. It's like all the things you feel about dogs. <laughs> yeah, she does, does have a whole um, book about dog poems. Um, the one about, someone mentioned in the chat, the one about Wild Wonderful Life. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that one. Wild Geese. Yeah, that's probably her most famous. It's a very good one. Um, the Messenger. Yeah, I have, um, I got introduced to Mary Oliver in college. And even though I've been a fan of her for a long time, there are still so many of her poems that I don't know because she just wrote so many. So there are um, a lot of great ones to explore. All right, so we will have chance to try to write some of our own poems in a little bit. So if you have a paper and pencil, or I always say you can use a voice recorder um, or a, a spare piece, piece of paper or your nature journal, whatever um, you've got. So. Last time, the workshop was Science and Imagination, and we had, this was based on my presentation of that title from International Nature Journaling Week, and we had some time just for free write and sharing. So some of my uh, workshops have been more presentation style, like one today, but last time was a lot more um, free form and we had time to write together. And it seemed like people really enjoyed that. So if you would like to see more of that, let me know. And um, yeah, if anyone would like this free PDF mini ebook, which if you have, if um, you haven't been here when I've talked about it, it's a new PDF I made that has the activities that I taught during International Nature Journaling Week. And I can put the link to that if anyone is interested. Okay, so today we're talking about Mary Oliver, as I already mentioned. Um, I really wanted to feature someone um, for Pride Month who is an LGBT nature writer. And I thought, who better than Mary Oliver, because pretty much everyone loves Mary Oliver. Um, and I know people talk about her a lot in the nature journal community. Um, but I don't know if everybody knows that she was in the LGBT community. And I think that's a really important part of um, what made her who she was. And so I think it's important to know about that. And um, because it is Pride Month, um, and I think it's just important that we make sure that everybody knows that everybody is welcome in the nature journaling community and in the environmental community in general. So just a quick mention, I think that a lot of people, when you think about like LGBT culture, you think a lot of like pride parades and maybe like um, like drag shows and gay bars and it's very urban. And those things are all a very important part of like queer culture. But I think that it's also really important to know that um, nature is part of queer culture too. And I think that's something that doesn't always get talked about a lot. 
Um, so I just saw this article the other day that was about LGBT environmentalists that you should know about. And one of them was Rachel Carson, who you might know, I had a whole workshop about her before here. And I love Rachel Carson. I never knew that she was um, in the LGBT community. Um, and as another example, there's this really awesome website called Queer Nature, which I won't talk about too much here, but um, you should definitely check it out. They're doing a lot of really important work. And Mary Oliver is part of that queer nature culture. Um, so she was born um, in 1935 and died in 2019. And um, just as a personal note, as a coincidence, she actually died the exact same day that um, my great grandma died. And it's a very weird thing to be thankful for, but it's um, just for me personally, it's, it, it means they're always going to be linked in my mind. So it's just this very strange kind of gift. And the fact that um, when she died, suddenly the whole internet was full of all of her poems and just like all of this comfort at the exact same time that I personally needed it. So it was just um, a strange coincidence. Um, so I didn't know a lot about her life before I researched for this presentation, but some of the things I learned are that she grew up um, in Ohio, um, but she didn't have a very great home life. Um, she experienced some abuse as a child, so she would go into nature um, and find refuge there. Um, and she was also extremely prolific. She wrote over 15 poetry collections. The first one was when she was 28, and she won a Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1984 and won the National Book Award in 1992. And yeah, I, she also was queer and I never knew that until she died. So I just think that is pretty interesting. So she did have a partner um, named Molly Malone Cook. Um, they were together for 40 years until she died in 2005. And I read that Mary Oliver frequently referred to her as just as M in her writing. And I'm not sure if this is because she was just trying to kind of keep it a secret um, or if there's another reason. But something really interesting that I learned recently is that um, her partner, Molly, was a photographer. And so if you've read Mary Oliver poems, you probably know that with one of her signature, um, like part of her style is how, um, or like one of the main themes in a lot of her poems is how to pay close attention to what's around you and and how to how to love the world that's around you and she kind of learned this from her partner molly um so if it weren't for that then we probably wouldn't have the mary oliver that we all know and love so a quote from her um is it has frequently been remarked about my own writings that I emphasize the notion of attention. This began simply enough to see that the way the flicker flies is greatly different from the way the swallow plays in the golden air of summer. It was my pleasure to notice such things. It was a good first step. But later, watching Anne when she was taking photographs and watching her in the dark room, and no less watching the intensity and openness with which she dealt with friends and strangers too, taught me what real tension, attention is about. Attention without feeling, I began to learn, is only a report. An openness, an empathy was necessary if the attention was to matter. Such openness and empathy M had in abundance and gave way freely. I was in my late 20s and early 30s and well filled with a sense of my own thoughts, my own presence. I was eager to address the world of words, to address the world with words. Then M instilled in me this deeper level of looking and working, of seeing through the heavenly visibles to the heavenly invisibles. I think of as always when I look at her photographs, the images of vitality, hopefulness, endurance, kindness, vulnerability. We each had our separate natures, yet our ideas, our influences upon each other became a rich and abiding confluence. And that's from an article on brain pickings, Mary Oliver on what attention really means. 
and her moving elegy for her soulmate. So this is a photo of Mary Oliver that was taken um, by Molly when they were younger. And I also learned that they lived in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is in Cape Cod. And I learned that this has been um, a popular place for LGBT people to live for about a hundred years. And there were a lot of free thinkers and artists who um, lived there. So um, guessing that's probably why the two of them moved there. And she wrote about it. I too fell in love with the town, that marvelous convergence of land and water, Mediterranean light, fishermen who made their living by hard and difficult work from frighteningly small boats, and both residents and sometimes visitors, the many artists and writers. People say to me, wouldn't you like to see Yosemite, the Bay of Fundy, the Brooks Range, she wrote in Long Life. I smile and answer, oh yes, sometime, and go off to my woods, my ponds, my sun-filled harbor, no more than a blue comma on the map of the world, but to me, the emblem of everything. And I think this is really important because um, we're, when we're doing nature writing or nature journaling, our place that we live is so important. Um, it's key to everything that we observe and everything that um, we do. And there's this idea that you don't have to go to a national park or to um, any place like that, but you know, all of us, the place that we live can be really special and important to us. Oh my, Libby, is that a kitten? They're adorable. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to distract everyone. My coworker brought a kitten to the office today. So this is what professional is going to look like today. The kitten's like up in my hair. It's a, it's a new baby. It's a brand, brand new baby that we felt like we needed to take care of. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. I didn't mean to get distracted myself, but I was to keep the kitty down. Um, so she did face some from professional critics in Mary Oliver's work. She did face some sexism regarding that. Um, a lot of critics described her as like, oh, she's just a throw pillow poet, you know, with some like phrases that you would put on, you know, decorations in your home or something like that um, wasn't really seen as very serious as kind of more fluffy and especially for you know being a female writer writing about nature and like flowers and pretty things like that um, wasn't sometimes was just seen as kind of fluffy but I guess those critics um, didn't really win out in the end because she did end up winning the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award and all of those things. Um, and yeah, so some of the things that she wrote about were more like lighthearted and, you know, writing about like the beautiful things in nature and all the good things. But she really was equally in touch with some of the, the darker aspects of nature. And um, so it, it wasn't really just romanticizing things. She really pulled in both aspects. Um, and she also believed that poetry shouldn't be fancy, that it should be easy to understand and that it should be accessible for people. Um, and so from the Poetry Foundation website, some of the quotes um, that I found there describing her work um, is that she is an indefatigable guide to the natural world, as visionary as Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, among the few American poets who can describe and transmit ecstasy while remaining a practical awareness of the world as one of predators and prey. So kind of what I was just saying, she was able to show how beautiful and wonderful the world is, but um, wasn't just romanticizing it either. She understood how the world really is too. Uh, another fun fact that I learned is that she would hide pencils in trees so that when she was on walks, if she forgot to bring a pencil with her, um, she could get a pencil that she hid earlier in one of the trees because one time she forgot to bring a pencil and um, yeah, she didn't want that to happen again. Oh, thank you, Brian. Um, Brian just put the link in the chat for the PDF I was talking about earlier. 
Okay, so now I want to show you some examples of her poetry. This is probably one of my favorite ones. I used to have this one in my email signature for a while. Um, it's called Instructions for Living a Life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So that's very short, but I feel like for me, it's very key to why I like nature journaling because the whole idea that we just, um, well, I can't really recap it because she explains it pretty well herself. Um, yeah, just paying close attention to things and finding that sense of wonder and sharing that with other people. This one is called Mysteries, yes. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity, while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. So this one reminds me a lot of how in, in nature journaling, one of the prompts we can say uses, I wonder, and looking for all those mysteries in nature and knowing that we don't have the answers and that we're always learning new things. This one is called, I worried. And I related to this one a lot. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, black jaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Um, yeah, so this is the her book about um, dog, all of dog poems, which I forgot who mentioned that earlier. This poem is also about one of her dogs. I don't think it's actually from this book, um, but it's called Percy and Books. Percy does not like it when I read a book. He puts his face over the top of it and moans. He rolls his eyes. Sometimes he sneezes. The sun is up, he says, and the wind is down. The tide is out and the neighbor's dogs are playing. But Percy, I say, ideas, the elegance of language, the insights, the funniness, the beautiful stories that rise and fall and turn into strength or courage. Books, says Percy. I ate one once and it was enough. Let's go. Still, what I want in my life is to be willing to be dazzled, to cast aside the weight of facts, and maybe even to float a little above this difficult world. I want to believe I'm looking into the white fire of a great mystery. I want to believe that the imperfections are nothing, that the light is everything, that it is more than the sum of each flawed blossom rising and falling. And I do. This one is called The Summer Day, and this is um, probably her most famous quote comes from this poem. I didn't actually know until recently that this was the whole poem where that, came, that quote came from. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? 
Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And these were just a few examples that I found of little like um, inspirational images with that quote. Um, these were a couple ones that I really liked. So I guess I can kind of see why some people might call it a throw pillow poet, but um, I think they are, her, her quotes are genuinely inspirational and a lot of people feel the same way about them. I really like this one, especially on the left. I was just talking to my friend the other day who said this one was her favorite Mary Oliver poem, so I wanted to include it. It's called The Journey. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough on a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do determined to save the only life you could save. This one's called praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. The messenger. My work is loving the world. Hear the sunflowers, hear the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness. Hear the quickening yeast, there the blue plums. Hear the clam deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still not half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. The Phoebe, the Delphinium, the sheep in the pasture, and the pasture, which is mostly rejoicing since all ingredients are here, which is gratitude to be given a mind and a heart, and these body clothes, a mouth which to give shouts of joy to the moth and to the wren, to the sleepy dug up clam, telling them all over and over how it is that we live forever. Um, and John Muir Laws actually quoted this one a, um, a couple months ago when he did a workshop about doing a birding nature journal that was for the Audubon Society. Um, he was saying the, give shouts of joy to the moth and the wren to the sleepy dug up clam. So that's um, how I first heard of this poem. And then lastly, we have wild geese. And of course, with any poem or any piece of writing, we can never know exactly what the author intended, but some people interpret this poem to be related to the context of her life as being in the LGBT community. And um, even though it's one of her most favorite poems, so that context is kind of overlooked, or one of her most famous, Poem. So that context is overlooked a lot, but I'm just going to play it here. Um, so if you, um, yeah, just listen to it and see if that gives a different perspective on the meaning that um, is in this poem. And I forgot if I clicked to um, share sound. So I'm just going to reshare it and include that. And, oh, where did all of your videos go?
Um, for some reason, your videos all disappeared for me. So let me just take a second to try to get them back. Okay, there you are. And All right, I don't know where your videos went again. <laughs> Not sure why that happened, but um, can everybody just write in the chat if you can see and hear the video? All right, I'm gonna stop from the book now and read a couple of old poems because if I don't, I get slapped. Wild geese. Is that better? <laughs> you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. I thought that was a funny clip because you can kind of tell she's tired of people requesting this poem, um, but it definitely is a really good one. Uh, I don't know why your videos keep disappearing now. It's kind of, I like being able to see all of your reactions and everything, but oh well. Okay. All right, I'm nope. going to stop. OK. And it was even um, quoted, I found this article called The Importance of LGBTQ Plus Visibility in School Curriculums. Um, and it had this um, piece of art with a student walking into a Mary Oliver book. Um, and that quote, well, whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting. Okay, so now I can give a little time to discuss um, what themes do you notice in her poems, and was there anything in particular that you liked um, or that resonated with you? And if you'd like, we can go back and look at any of the particular poems. Hashi? I really like her, her, when she talks about not knowing the answers. Um, I, I wrote down, let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. And I think that's so important, not just in looking at nature, but in, you know, the sort of political echo chambers we get into and, um, you know, just that whole thing about how we, we value certainty more than curiosity who said that recently was that did something you brought up last week I wrote that down in my journal too how our society how our society values certainty more than curiosity but but so I love it when she expresses that theme in her poems how it, it's it's not knowing the answers it's just doing the wondering and doing the looking and paying attention that is the value 
Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Ashi. Um, yeah, and from the chat, um, someone says, there is a very gentle and subtle feeling of rebellion in them. Um, do you want to expand on that anymore? Um, it's almost like a defiance for how she wants to live her life. And I think it was especially um, the journey. That one I really loved. That was the first time I've heard that. So thank you for sharing. It was kind of about, I mean, I interpret it as her choosing her own life despite what other people were thinking about what she should do um, and just going and doing her own thing. Yeah, if I could, um, I don't know if this is completely related, but this is something I was thinking about recently is that sometimes with various things, whether it's like LGBT or disabilities or like racism or other things, there are people who are, say like, why do you have to make this into a political thing? Like, why can't you just live your life? And it's like, well, I think people just want to live their lives. It's like, there wouldn't have to be an act of rebellion in it if that was already possible. So that's um, what you just said made me think about that. Does anyone else have um, a thought to share? Libby? I was noticing she seems to be like pushing back against perfectionism. Like maybe that's just my own hit on it because I'm always struggling with that. But there was like, you know, I may not be young and I may not be perfect and my coat may be torn, but but this is this is me living the life I'm supposed to live. This is me doing the work I came here to do. I, I love that. Yeah, I think um, perfectionism is something that we can all um, struggle with sometimes. Like it's good to wanna do your best, but we don't have to be perfect. And I think that observing nature kind of reinforces that because nature is so complex and you know, it's not always beautiful. It's not always a pretty picture, but it, it is what it is. And that's okay. Yeah, so thank you for sharing your thoughts too. Um, and that idea that poetry doesn't have to be something that's like really complicated or um you know something that only some people can understand like it can be simple like it can have a simple meaning to it but have something that's um still really deep and that can mean a lot to people anybody else I just wanted to say that um, it, a long time ago, nearly 25 years ago, I left Australia and moved to the US and I just, I did it. I just walked away from everything. I came with nothing. I came with no money, no job. It was one of those sort of <laughs> things where I just, I walked, I was walked away from a marriage and it was after a little while here, I read Mary Oliver's poem, The Journey. And I was like, yes, this, this, and I actually used it as an explanation to my family back in Australia about why, why I left, that I was saving the only life I could save. Thank you for sharing that, Hershey. Um, I'm glad that poem was um, meant a lot to you. And yeah, that is a good thing about poems too, is that sometimes, you know, their experience that aren't, aren't really universal, We've had a whole, oh, we had a whole discussion about that last time we talked about poems here, but um, there still can be feelings or emotions or thoughts that um, we do share with other people, but that sometimes can be hard to articulate. So I think that's something that can be really powerful about a poem. If you capture one of those things, then it, it can help somebody else explain what they're going through too.
Okay, anybody else or um So somebody wrote in the chat, I really dislike the idea that accessible writing isn't worthy of critical attention. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that like, uh, like some poetry can be a little bit harder to understand. I think sometimes that can be um, part of, you know, poetry is trying to understand it, putting your own meaning on it and not to invalidate that kind of poetry. But yeah, I think that um, more accessible writing should be given better attention to um, because it can make it more, um, I, I feel like there's this idea that it can be like, if like, oh, you're not good enough to understand poetry, like you don't really get it, um, but it should be something that like everybody can enjoy. Um, and, yeah, whatever kind of poetry a particular person enjoys, that's valid. All right, so any other thoughts or would you guys like to go into trying to write a little bit of your own poetry? All right, let's move on. But if anybody does have any more thoughts, um, just speak up. You can raise your hand or type in the chat at any time. Okay. Okay, it says the video thumbnails are minimized to optimize full screen video clip screen sharing but I don't need to share video anymore. So I really would like to see you guys. Show video panel. Okay, there we go. I can see you again, yay. Okay, so I think we could take just about 10 minutes or so to try to write. Um, again, it doesn't have to be perfect or fancy. Just put some words on a paper. Um, if you have um, maybe some nature observations that you've written about in your nature journal recently, or maybe you have a nature journal, nature object in front of you, or you can see out the window, you could write about that. Um, it also doesn't have to be about nature. If you want to do something that's more internal, something that's kind of inspired by the, the themes and the style of Mary Oliver. Um, so you can do whatever you want. Um, but if you'd like, I did, I took her poem, Mysteries, Yes, and made it into kind of an outline. If you feel a little bit stuck, or if this seems interesting to you, you could try filling this in. So um, if you were at International Nature Journaling Week, if you watched Emily Ligren's um, presentation about making poetry out of your nature journal, so um, if anybody here is not familiar, one of the main prompts that we can use, um, especially starting out in nature journaling is doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So we can use observations and questions and memories or connections to, if we're writing them down anyway, we can kind of make them into a poem. And so this is kind of like the, I wonder part of that, you know, what are some mysteries that we think about? Um, from nature and you could kind of make it into a poem like that. So I'm not really sure how that will work out, but it's there if you wanna try it or you can just do your own thing. So I'll put a timer on for about 10 minutes and then we'll see how, um, again, that's a very short amount of time. So don't feel like you have to make a finished poem. Just, you can start getting some ideas or notes down. Um, doesn't have to be full sentences. It could just be bullet points or just words here and there. It could be more stream of consciousness. Um, it's just a first draft or even part of a first draft or even just notes that you might later make a draft about. So don't put too much pressure onto yourself. Um, let's just see how much we, and let's just see what we can create in 10 minutes. And then we can have some time if anyone would like to share.
Okay, that was 10 minutes. Um, if anyone feels like you still need more time, you're welcome to write more um, after we go. But I just want to make sure that we have time for if anyone wants to share anything that you wrote. Um, and I can stay on a little bit after one o'clock too, if anybody wants to share, um, but not have it be recorded. So, um, and if anybody else found yourself wondering, um, like, like, oh, I'm just writing some words. Is this really a poem? I was kind of feeling the same way just now. So you don't have to worry about that. It's all just kind of the part of the writing process. Um, so is there anybody who would like to share? And you can either just read what you wrote or if you just, or if you're, um, if you just want to explain a little bit about what you did or how it went, you're welcome to do that too. I don't see anybody volunteering. Um, Um, you might, Jasmine might want to wait. Oh, Hashi, would you like to share now? Um, I had two little sort of snippets, um, both based on looking out the window. Um, this is the first one. I've planted flowers, purple, red, and yellow, but the finches ignore their perfect blooms. They scurry all over the rangy, messy, brittle bush. They know where the real food is. And then the other one was, fog blows up the canyon from the sea, chilling me. It'll be hot later. For now, I'm dressed in a cloud. Thank you for sharing, Hashi. Um, I really like how the first one compared um, how you think about the flowers and then how the finches think about the flowers. And then I like how you compared um, the second one with the, the fog and the, how it's like you're, you're wearing it. I just like that um, imagery a lot. Um, would you like to open it to anybody else to comment? And um, we have some nice comments in the chat. Lovely, lovely, so visual. Thanks for sharing. That's from the chat. And I also like how that really um, does incorporate your ecosystem where you live because we don't get fog where I live. So that wouldn't be part of a nature poem that I would typically write. So um, thank you for sharing that um, that observation with me. Where do, you, where do you live, Rebecca? I live in upstate New York. Oh, okay. You don't get fog there? I mean, maybe once in a while, but not, no. not often. Okay. Is there anybody else? Um, or if everybody else here would rather share with the recording off, I can just stop the recording now. Danny? There's a uh, airplane flying around, so sorry. <laughs> um, oh, that's okay. So I'm, I'm sitting outside in, in my yard right now and it's um, in the morning, it, we started at nine for me and it's just it's a lovely day so what I wrote was um high cirrus soft air I can smell the ocean crickets are 10 degrees slow that's it <laughs> thank you for sharing I might not think of something particular to say, I guess a reaction or feedback to everybody's poem, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. That mostly just means that I'm tired. <laughs> um, and I left you speechless. That's, that's yeah. never a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a comment that says, I can relate to your poem. Um, great combination of observations. 
Yeah, we can take, so we can all take our list of observations, just noticing with our five senses what's going on around us. And that can just be a list um, or it can also be a poem. And I think the difference is what she said about attention, um, you know, just reporting the facts without feeling it's just a report. But if we do have some feeling or some of ourselves into it, then it's a poem. There's not really like a fine line for where do you where do you draw the line between like a scientific list of observations and a poem. Um, that's kind of up to interpretation, but we can all write a poem and it's not um, as difficult or complicated as um, you might think that it has to be. I have to jump to a work meeting. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming, Hashi. See you at Wild Wonder, I hope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Um, okay. Wild Wonder is next week. So we won't be having this workshop. Um, though we have the main Wild Wonder Conference and the Wild Wonder Teacher Conference, which I am helping to organize. So hi, Ray Bonto. What's up? So, I wrote a little silly limerick, which is about a collection of rocks I got from uh, Richmond. There was once from Richmond a few rocks, whose minerals were on, all under locks. I wonder why don't they let us see their secret? I wonder uh, if it is just because it, it's a rock. <laughs> rock, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Rainbanto. Um, yeah, my, myself, my notes were kind of definitely more free form. So I'm impressed that you wrote a poem with a form like that in just 10 minutes. So great job. And yeah, it's it was um, in the chat. People are saying fun poem, fun with three exclamation marks. Thanks for sharing. So yeah, that's another thing about poems. It doesn't have to be serious. It can be um, more lighthearted and fun. Valerie. Good morning. I had an experience in the yard this morning, and it so coincided with the idea of pray and what was it pray and that Mary Oliver referred to anyway it I was just kind of compelled to try to make some sense of my brief encounter this morning so I was typing in pages as it did so I could read it I scribbled so quickly so here's what I wrote Walking the yard in cool morning air, Maggie and I were startled by the flesh of wings and the sudden silence of the finches in the pistache tree. The cooper's hawk landed on the fence. With a backward glance at us, she regrasped her meal and flew off. Slowly the sounds of the birds returned. The hawk and the finches in the tree were thankful. That's all. But it kind of helped me process my little finch. Yeah. Oh, so you mean the predator and prey? That was it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she could yeah. have been feeding her babies too, so. Yeah, because that's that's part of nature too. Um, and yeah, it is more difficult that it's um, everything is not all just like happiness and sunshine and bird song all the time. But, um, that's another thing poetry can help us to deal with 
the more difficult emotions. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Valerie. All right, it's one o'clock. Um, if anyone has to go, thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, so we won't meet next time. It's wild wonder. And then um, after that, um, the week after, we'll do sort of a reflection on wild wonder and write about what we learned and what we got out of it. And um, if anyone's not going to Wild Wonder, you can just do free writing during the writing part, and then you might get to pick up some tips um, when people share. So hopefully that will be something that will still be valuable to everybody, even whether you go to Wild Wonder or not. Um, oh, I also want to mention I'm going to have to change the schedule for this because I'm starting a new job that week. Um, so it will probably have to be in the evenings for me. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the time. So I apologize to everybody who's from Europe because it might be too late for you, but um, I just can't teach it during the day while I'm at my new job. So um, yeah, I'm gonna turn off the recording now, but if anybody would like to share and not have it recorded, this would be a good time, so. This has been Writing Workshop Wednesday about Mary Oliver. Thank you everyone for coming.